I'll, I'll, I'll pitch you several passages of scripture starting with Matthew 26. But I want to do a summary of the life of Judas under this title. So close, yet so far away. So close, yet so far away. It was the Passover, the annual celebration of Israel's exodus out of Egypt. It was also the Last Supper, the final meal Jesus would share with his disciples before his death at the cross. During that dinner, Jesus shocked his disciples with an announcement. Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The sorrowful disciples asked, Lord, is it I? Matthew chapter 26, verses 23 and 24, Jesus answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Jesus demonstrates the cost of faithfulness by going by what is written concerning him in the scriptures. Judas demonstrates the cost of unfaithfulness by betraying the son of man into the hands of his enemy for 30 pieces of silver. When he went in the upper room that night, Judas already knew what he was going to do. And yet, with the rest of the disciples, he dared to ask, is it I, Rabbi? Matthew 26, 25, Jesus answered, you have said so. And within hours, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. The Bible presents Judas's betrayal of Jesus as a divinely ordained in John chapter 6, verse 70, Jesus says, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? The 71st verse of John 6 goes on to explain, He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. In John 13, verse 10, during the Last Supper, Jesus, after washing the disciples' feet, said, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. John 13, verse 11 goes on to explain, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Judas's betrayal of Jesus was a divinely ordained act. And yet as you read the story of Judas in the four gospels, there seems to be this sense that things didn't have to be this way. Judas 
not just a disciple, he was one of the original 12 apostles. His sincerity, integrity, and consistency allowed him to be a part of the band of disciples throughout the three-year ministry of Jesus. Judas joined the other disciples when Jesus sent them out to preach, do miracles, and cast out demons. Wait a minute. Judas was even allowed by Jesus to hold the money bag. Just seems that it didn't have to be this way, that he didn't have to waste his life, his ministry, and his opportunity. But he did. Why did Judas do it? It may have been a love of money, it may have been hateful treachery in his heart. It may have been some warped sense of devotion. We do not know. As Pierce Carey wrote, more is told of Jesus in the Gospels than any other disciple except Peter. Yet he is little known. Indeed, he is wrapped in a mystery. That's right. Life of Judas is a mystery. But from this life, there is a clear warning. And it is this. You can be close and yet so far away at the same time. Let me try that another way. Let me tighten that up for you. You can be close to Jesus in religious activity, but far from Jesus in personal relationship. The story is told that when Leonardo da Vinci painted his famous The Last Supper in the 15th century, he began that great work of art by painting Jesus in the center of the table. It took him some years to finish, and he finished by painting Judas. And the story is told that when the man came in who was to sit and pose for the portrait of Judas, when he walked in the room, it is said that he broke down into tears as he remembered that years prior, he had sat in that same room posing as Jesus. That story may or may not be an urban legend, but the warning is absolutely clear. It can happen to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let me say that again. If you listen to this sermon about Judas and sit there thinking that it can never happen to you, you are actually a prime candidate to fall flat. My favorite personal prayer course song my mother taught me, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Do you know that prayer course? I checked the hymnal this morning. There are five verses in my hymnal of that prayer course. One of the verses is, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Another is, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Another is, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart. Another is, Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. Did you know, however, the fourth verse of that song says, I don't want to be like Judas in my heart. May that be your prayer today as we begin Holy Week. Lord, don't let me be like Judas in my heart. 
There are five lessons from the life of Judas that I want you to see. It warns us that you could be close and yet so far. Let me walk you through these five lessons as quickly as I can. Lesson number one. Being in the company of Jesus does not mean you are saved. Being in the company of Jesus does not necessarily mean that you are genuinely saved. You can be unsaved and unchurched you can be churched and unsaved. But I don't think you can really be saved and unchurched. Unchurched Christian is not a biblical category. If you ask the New Testament, ask James, Peter, John, Paul, any of the writers of the New Testament, what do you say to a Christian who is not a part of the church, their answer would be, why are you calling them a Christian if they're not a part of the church? Christ is the head of the church. The church is the body of Christ, and Christ does not have out-of-body experiences. To be in fellowship with the head, you've got to be hooked up with the body. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters and whoever does not love his brother abides in death. The evidence of genuine salvation is that you not just love Jesus, you love everybody that loves Jesus. But fellowship with church alone is not assurance of salvation. Judas is the proof. Judas was one of the 12 original apostles. But his name was not written in the Lamb's book of life. In fact, in John 17, verse 2, Jesus calls Judas the son of perdition, the son of destruction. He was doomed for destruction. That's not just Judas. That's, that's the fate of anyone who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Warren Worsby said it correctly. If you are not born again, there is coming a day when you will wish you were never born at all. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage make you an automobile. You must be born again. In Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan wrote, Then I saw that there was a way to hell even from the gates of heaven. What does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. Let me bottom line that for you. That means that you can go to hell from a church pew just as easily as you go to hell from a bar stool. Being in the company of the disciples does not in and of itself guarantee that you are right with God. Worship attendance, church membership, moral behavior, generous giving, charitable acts, ministry participation, and, and even church leadership doesn't assume you are right with God. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. For on that day, there will be many who say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many marvelous works in your name? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. 
you workers of iniquity. So being religious is not what makes you right with God. How do you get right with God? John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Lesson number two. Divided loyalties will harden your heart against Jesus. Divided loyalties will harden your heart against Jesus. Luke 22 verses 1 and 2 says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. The religious leaders were at this point were done playing with Jesus. They determined to silence him once and for all. But they needed to arrest him secretly, lest they further inflame the messianic passions of the Passover crowd. But they didn't know how to get him. Luke 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. Verse 4, he went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. What blows me away is the religious leaders didn't go looking for Judas. Judas went looking for them. To find a way to sell Jesus out. Judas was a devoted disciple. But Satan manipulated the unsurrendered areas of his heart to betray Jesus. Charles Spurgeon wrote, the raw material of the devil is an angel bereft of holiness. You cannot make Judas except out of an apostle. The devil is not in the streets trying to get people he already got. He's trying to get you to turn on Jesus. And his schemes will work if your heart has divided loyalties. Two divided loyalties hardened Judas' heart against Jesus. The first is a love of money. John 13, 29 says that Judas had the money back. Judas was the CFO of the nonprofit ministry of Jesus. But John 12, verse 6 says he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was in it. Contrary to what the, the prosperity teachers tell you, Jesus was not a wealthy man. Foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but I, the son of man, have nowhere to lay my head. By some kindness, he would be given money that was put in a money bag that was entrusted to Judas. And the Bible says Judas, walking with Jesus, was taking them coins one for Jesus, one for me. And while you laugh, brothers and sisters, let me warn you. A sinful love of money caused Judas to betray Jesus. Matthew 26, 14 through 16 says, Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and says, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And when they paid him 30 pieces of silver, from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. And so I want to warn you, saints, you can't love money and love Jesus at the same time. 
Matthew 6, verse 21 says, For where a man's treasure is, there will his what? Heart be also. That's a countercultural, supracultural idea. It's counterintuitive. What we think is, where a man's heart is, there will his treasure be. That if something or someone has your heart, you'll give them your treasure. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says where your treasure is, your heart will follow. The warning is, do not invest in anything that's not worth loving. <laughs> because when you invest your time, your money, and your affections in a thing, your heart will follow what you invest in. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10, rightly warns us, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Stay away from evil. But, I mean, stay away from evil, but run from anything the Bible calls the root of evil. You know what the root of evil means? The root of evil means if you play with that sin, other stuff will grow from it. If you, if you love money, ain't no telling what you might do. You may even sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver if you let the love of money get in your heart. His other problem was what I want to call self-styled religion. Self-styled religion. Judas betrayed, believed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah King, the fulfillment of Old Testament promise, prophecy, and prediction. But he had the wrong vision of what the Messiah King would be and do. He expected the Messiah to be a military hero who would overthrow the occupying powers of Rome, make the city of Jerusalem the headquarters for a reborn nation, and he basically, like the people of the day, expected the Messiah to come and, you know, make Israel great again. But the more time passed, the more obvious it was that it was not Jesus' agenda to make Israel great again. In fact, Judas is following Jesus around and it's obvious Jesus spent more time fighting religious leaders than he did fighting Roman overlords. Judas basically saw where this would end, and he refused to be a part of any movement that ended with its leader on the cross. So he joined the opposition party. Decades ago, Richard Niebuhr described liberal theology this way. He says that liberal theologians, or another word for unbelievers, Teach that a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministry of a Christ without a cross. That is not the religion of Jesus. Christianity is not a theology of glory. Many people want a theology of glory where you get glory without suffering. Christianity is a theology of the cross where you only get glory through suffering. You'll never be devoted to Jesus if your devotion to Jesus is only based on what you can get out of him. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus does not say, if any man would come after me, let him jump in my limo. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself. and Take up his cross. 
follow me. What does it cost to follow Jesus, Shiloh? It'll cost you everything. You're going to have to say no to yourself, take up a cross, and follow him wherever he leads. It'll cost you everything to follow Jesus. But let me give you a little bit of good news. There ain't a lot of places to amen on this sermon, but I hope I got a witness in here besides myself. It's worth what it costs. It, 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 it may cost you everything to follow Jesus. But it's worth what it costs. Lesson three. The sinner will find no true friendship in his sin. The sinner will find no true friendship in his sin. Matthew 27 verses 3 and 4 says this. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said... What is that to us? See to it yourself. The sinister plan to betray Jesus fully succeeded. But at some point, Judas changed his mind about the whole thing. He didn't just confess his wrongdoing privately. He went back to the religious leaders he conspired with. And said to those religious leaders, I must make a confession. I have betrayed an innocent man. And not only did he confess his wrongdoing, church, he literally put his money where his mouth was. He tried to give them the money back. And his co-conspirators his homeboys, the friends that got him caught up in sin, the one that was hanging out with him when he was doing wrong, now said, yeah, that's your problem, not ours. John Bisagno wrote, the loneliest and most foolish person in the world is the one who ruined by sin turns to the sin that caused his downfall only to find not wanted signs on the door. Church, let me particularly say this. This is for everybody, but let me lean in and say this to the young people in the room. Do not make friends with sin because sin will never be your friend. The world will tell you it's your choice. You can live any kind of way you want to live. It's your life. It's your body, it's your truth. You choose whatever way you want to live, and they're right about that. But what they don't tell you is the whole story. With every choice, there are consequences. That's the part they don't tell you. Choices bring consequences. In fact, not only is, are there consequences with every choice, but some choices have a way of limiting, limiting future choices. You go downtown and jump off a skyscraper, you can choose, you're free to choose to do that. But once you jump, you out of choices. You just got to deal with the consequences of your choice. Let me give it to you biblically. Galatians 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That eighth verse then says this as exposition of verse 7. 
For whoever sows to his own flesh shall from his flesh reap corruption. Do you get that? If you live to please your fleshly, sinful, worldly desires, the same flesh you live to please will turn on you. And destroy your life. Have you, uh, have you ever heard how Eskimos hunt wild foxes? They, um, they take a big knife, coat it with blood, and then let it freeze, and then pour more blood on it, and then stick it handle first in the snow. And the, 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 the wild fox smells the blood and is attracted to the blade and starts licking the blood off the blade and keeps licking and keeps licking until he dies because as the fox feverishly laps up the blood, he never recognizes that at some point he's no longer licking blood off the blade, but he's licking his own blood to his death. So in a real sense, the hunter doesn't kill it. The hunter just sets it up to kill itself. And hear me, church. All of us got some appetites. That if God don't protect us from ourselves, we'll destroy our lives. Sure, Satan was clearly involved in Judas's betrayal. But Judas was his own worst enemy. So are you. So am I. I am my own worst enemy. I don't got to worry about nobody that don't like me if I can just keep me straight. We're our own worst enemy. Sin is not a friend. It's an enemy determined to destroy you. James 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he, he himself tempts no one but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire and then when it has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death number four repentance repentance is the only way to deal with the guilt of sin Judas was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. All the disciples deserted him, but Peter and Judas specifically failed the Lord. Peter denied Jesus three times. Judas betrayed Jesus into enemy hands. But I want you to get this. Both Peter and Judas failed big time. Peter was restored and became a key leader of the early church. Judas was overcome with sorrow and committed suicide. The difference between these two stories can be summed up in one word. Repentance. After Peter's sin, he repented. Judas, however, though he had regret and remorse, he did not repent. He never took the matter to God. He never came back to Jesus. His life tells us the only real and right way to deal with the guilt of sin is to repent. It means a change of mind. It's, it's, to, it's to make a U-turn. It's to acknowledge 
that God's way is right, my way is wrong, I'm going to stop going my way and I'm going to turn around and start going God's way. How does that work? I'm glad you asked. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, if you just tell God like it is, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, you don't have to live your life consumed with guilt about the mistakes of your past. True repentance leads to the sparing mercy of God through faith in Jesus Christ, who died to pay for your sins and rose to give you new life. One writer described what it was like for Judas to be on the heel of regret. Listen to what he says. At the trail's end, there are two trees. One is weathered and leafless. It is dead but still sturdy. Its bark is gone, leaving smooth wood bleached white by the ears. The twigs and buds no longer sprout, only bare branches fork out from the trunk. And on the strongest of these branches is tied a hangman's noose. It was here that Judas dealt with his failure. But if only Judas would have looked at the adjacent tree. It's also dead. Its wood is also smooth. But there is no noose tied to its crossbeam. There's no more death on that tree. One death was enough. One death for all. Wait, 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 wait. If only Judas could have heard the good news. You, you, you don't have to hang yourself. Because in a few hours, as a result of what you did, the Savior is going to get hung up for your hang-ups. Y'all not hearing me here. Because of the one who hung on a tree for you, your failure is not final. If you run to the cross... Throw yourself on the mercy of God and repent of your sins. God today is ready, willing, and able to give you another chance. Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5 says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day. For Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer. I don't have time to deal with all of that. That's no pulpit excuse for poor exposition. But David says, when I tried to hide my sin from God, it started messing with me physically. I was getting old before my time. It don't take disease to make you sick. sick. Guilt can do it too. He says, guilt was ruining me. Physically, emotionally, psychologically, I was groaning all day. Then he said, verse 5, let me tell you how I got over it. I acknowledge my sin to you. And I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You missed that. I need to give it to you again. He did not say I confessed and you forgave. He said, I just said, I will confess. And when I said, I will confess, 
you forgave. What David is saying is that God is more eager to forgive than you are to repent. The bad news is that you can you can run, but you can't hide from God. The good news is you can run to God and you can hide in God. And the blood of Jesus will give you another chance. I got one more lesson. One more lesson. Let me share it with you and I'll go sit down. The last lesson I want you to see from Judas's life is this. Evil cannot overthrow the purposes of God. My daddy used to tell a story about an old man walking down a road and saw some boys playing baseball in the field. The boy in the outfield, he asked him how the game was going, what's the score? The boy said, 10 to nothing. He said, who's winning? The boy said, they are. He said, well, you sure look happy to be losing 10 to nothing. Boy hit his mitt and said, I ain't worried about that. We ain't got the bat yet. When you read about the plot of the religious leaders, the betrayal of Judas, and the death of Jesus on the cross, it seems as if evil has won. But God always triumphs over the evil of man. Some of y'all wonder why I don't talk about some of the evils of the world more in my sermons. I admit that I don't because I'm not preoccupied with that. I know the world is filled with injustice and corruption and racism I don't spend a lot of time thinking or talking about that I just know you just gotta let, let God get to the plate I, I don't care how much the devil may be seeming to run up the score the devil doesn't have the last word evil doesn't have the last word wickedness doesn't have the last word God has the last word Oh, the church needs to overthrow a wicked system. No, we don't. Judas says, God don't have to overthrow the wickedness. He can use the wickedness for his glorious plan. Y'all don't like that? Let me give you some Bible to go with that. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I'm talking to somebody in this room. You've been betrayed. Your heart has been broken. People have let you down. The church has disappointed you. Hang on in there. God is able to take what is meant for evil and work it out for your good. Uh, 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 I, 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 I grew up, I grew up in Los Angeles. I was dating my wife when the OJ trial started. We would just sit and watch the trial. The whole city would just watch the trial. All, and it made stars out of the attorneys. The defense attorneys and the prosecutors became big stars. But you know what? I was impressed with the judge. 
Judge Ito. High-powered prosecutors, big-time defense attorneys would make their presentation, but the man on the bench could just say, overrule. And all of their arguments would be dismissed by the man on the bench. Y'all not hearing me. I'm trying to let y'all alone. I, I'm just trying to tell you that the one on your side is not just a man on the bench. He the Lord on the throne. And he's able to to overrule the plans of the enemy. He's able to overrule the schemes of the devil. He's able to overrule the wickedness of the world. If you want proof he can turn it around, just run to the cross and look at Jesus. The cross is man at his worst, but God at his best. Acts chapter 2, 22 through 24. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, Delivered up by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised them up. <laughs> Loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. God, not Judas... God had the last word in the death of Jesus on the cross. And in his sovereign grace, God chose to use the betrayal of Judas as the means to provide the forgiveness of all who after Judas Betray Jesus. Judas missed his opportunity. But it's not too late for you. <laughs> Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Because with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. I wish I could say it the way I feel it. Let me just tell you my testimony and I'm sitting down. I'll save my holler for Good Friday. <laughs> There's a little boy who was trying to reach 100 pounds. He got to 85, 86, 87. Couldn't reach 100. One day, I'm sitting down, he, he sat, stood on the scale and to his surprise, the needle went way past 100. He was celebrating till he heard giggling behind him. And saw that his elder brother had slipped into the room and put his foot on the scale and made the needle go way past the mark. That's my testimony. That's why I am what I am. That's why I am where I am. I've missed the mark so many times. I've said things I shouldn't have said and done things I shouldn't have done and gone places I shouldn't have gone. 
but thanks be to God, my elder brother named Jesus put his foot on the scale. Hallelujah. So that I pass all of God's divine inspection. I can hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. But he washed me. Anybody glad you've been washed? Hey! Hey! He washed me!